We are here with another episode of the Investing RN Podcast. Bring in the energy, bring in the heat, bring in the smiles, because Colin doesn't like it when I start like this. <laughs> I don't even know what you're saying at this point. <laughs> anyway, we have today Savannah Arroyo, Arroyo, also known as the Net Worth Nurse across all social media platforms. And she describes what that means to be a, because to be across all platforms. Some of us <laughs> no, to be a net worth nerd. No, I right. know that's not it. <laughs> to be what net worth means. She describes that because some of us didn't know what that was until recently. <laughs> <laughs> some of us still can't say the word, but she is doing some cool stuff. She worked her way up into the managerial position in the hospital. Um, and then she started doing real estate and has been doing some syndications, which is interesting. Uh, cause it's basically mm-hmm. just, just taking money and just bringing it and then sending it out, deploying it and making more money for <laughs> everyone. But she talks about, um, her goals in life and how that changed when she realized that there are other options. We'll see you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Investing RN. Today we're joined by Savannah Arroyo, uh, otherwise known on Instagram and other platforms as the Net Worth Nurse. She is the CEO and founder of the Net Worth, Nur- Net Worth Nurse, which is her newest startup. And uh, pretty good history in uh, nursing. Sounds like she's been about everywhere in the hospital and uh, now still working in the hospital, but focusing on real estate. So we're going to get into a little bit of everything today. So welcome to the show today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, so uh, maybe you can start off by telling us a little bit about your your career in nursing, how you got into it, and uh, what I guess where you are today now. Yeah, definitely. So I really knew from a young age I wanted to go into nursing. So right out of to, after high school, went into college pursuing my nursing degree, and I graduated 2013. Um, worked in a few different specialties, but it was naturally drawn towards leadership and. Uh, positions and process improvement. I loved operations and how things worked. And so really early on into my career, I went back to school and I got my master's degree in nursing leadership and administration and had my eyes set on becoming a CNO, a chief nursing officer. And I started climbing the ladder in a corporate uh, system down in Los Angeles to do that. And beginning of 2020, after having my second daughter, my priorities started shifting. My husband and I were both working very demanding jobs, Monday through Friday, eight to five, and we didn't really have the flexibility and time freedom that we wanted to have in our daughter's lives. And so we started looking for alternative ways to build wealth, to have multiple streams of income coming in. And we stumbled upon real estate for obvious reasons. It's one of the best ways out there to grow wealth. Um, and so started purchasing real estate. And uh, now we primarily do real estate syndication. So we jo- join forces with other healthcare professionals who want to passively invest in real estate. That's great. So you, so you, uh, so you were full time nursing, doing only nursing up until when, um, and at what point did you start kind of looking into real estate as an option? Yeah. So I was in administration until 2021, and then that's when I left my full time gig. Um, otherwise, I was building my real estate business on top of a full time job. So it was working the full time gig, coming home, hanging out with the kids, doing bath time, bedtime, and then really every night from 8 p.m. till midnight, my husband and I were grinding on our real estate business. So did that for a couple of years. And then I was able to walk away from my full-time administration job and then just work per diem in the hospital. Um, But then my husband recently quit his full-time W-2 six months ago and we relocated up to Northern California. And nursing is so, so flexible. So it was very easy for me to go back to work part-time and then hold all the benefits so that he was able to transition out of that full-time role. That's I, the the benefit piece of it is so awesome. And I think that's, what's great about nursing is being able to like do this, you know, explore other adventures and then like have that little piece and you can just do something part-time and get those benefits. Cause uh, not a lot of jobs you can do that with, I guess Lowe's and home Depot I've heard, are great, <laughs> but that's <laughs> but that's something different. 
<laughs> but uh, so you worked through the whole COVID crisis and uh, kind of where were you at there? And that's that's about the time you started investing in 2020s. When you were and you were in that administration yeah. during that time, right? So this is not we haven't really talked to anybody that was in administration during these yeah. times. Yeah. It's it's more like but, the nurses that are just all oh, crazy burnout. So you can bring it. Well, and then the travel nurses that were getting like crazy, like contracts and all that stuff. So they, everybody, all those people loved it. But yeah, how was it from the administration side? Yeah, I actually worked two different administrative roles throughout the COVID pandemic. So when the pandemic first um, hit, I was working as a clinical supervisor for an orthopedic practice. So I've overseen four different ortho offices in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. We had 11 different surgeons and I was overseeing the clinical aspect of their ambulatory practice. And so, um, yeah, that was very eye-opening because all the surgery centers were shut down down, electives were completely canceled. And so um, really through both my administration roles, working through the pandemic, it opened my office door literally to hundreds of conversations with nurses and other healthcare professionals about their finances and where they were with their money. And it was really shocking for me. I mean, at the time I was starting to invest in real estate and just starting to chat with that and opening up conversations with other nurses and healthcare professionals. And they really didn't have any insight into basic financial literacy, um, didn't know how to invest their money. Um, I can't tell you how many nurses I've talked to who have never set up a budget literally because they don't want to see where their money is going every month. Um, and so really all of these conversations that I was having with healthcare professionals throughout the pandemic, one made me more passionate to share the real estate investing strategies that we do because they're passive opportunities for healthcare professionals to come in and invest in real estate really hands off and the returns outperform the market. I mean, on our deals, we're earning anywhere between 15 to 20% average annualized return. And the stock market usually earns about six, 7%. Right now it's not doing that well, but um, I, so it's just a different investment alternative. So um, that was really great to be able to share with nurses. And then also it really led to um, the foundation of my startup company in Best Health, which is a financial wellness platform for healthcare professionals. So this is a product that we're taking to healthcare organizations as a value add benefit for their employees. So we're um, piggybacking on mental health, right? So financial wellness is a huge piece of mental health. I mean, 73% of Americans say that financial stress is the number one stress in their life. Um, and there's really not a lot of resources to combat that. And so we're looking to integrate within the healthcare system to get this information to as many healthcare professionals as possible. So you're not, so this invest health, this is not something you're, t you're dealing with like individual nurses or individual people you're, you're going to the employer and, and supplying it to the entire business. Yeah, exactly. We don't have a B2C product right now. Our product's B2B. So um, we're working directly with staffing agencies, healthcare organizations, and then also universities because we feel like if medical students and nursing students can get this as early into their career as possible, the more profound effect it'll have on the entire healthcare system. I mean, fi financial wellness and financial literacy is a huge piece of that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, the motivation be behind what we're doing because we both as nurses felt like there was that that piece was missing so much and and that that thing you mentioned about uh, the nurses not budgeting because they don't want to see where money's going like that was that was totally me and my wife and my wife's also a nurse and that's josh's sister but we dug ourselves into a pretty big hole you know we got married that that started like the kind of whole problem and then from there it just snowballed and it wasn't until we sat down with uh he was our he was our accountant at the time, but he also I went to school with him, played soccer with him, and he married us. And he was our accountant. He sat down. He was like, he's like, man, you guys just you have to like just put this down on paper. He's like, that's like the first step is just recognizing it, and even just doing that, you're steps ahead of everyone else because a lot of people just won't even like just recognize it. Mm -hmm. So what is this like? What does Invest Health kind of look like? Um, I guess for the employees, like you know, if you're in a system in a school in a hospital, like. What, is, what does that kind of look like for them? Yeah, so it's an entire uh, financial plan. So they come onto our platform and uh, like within 10 minutes of them clicking through some questions about their finances and debt and loans and what their assets and liabilities in a way, then it gives a financial report card. And it's a very extensive financial report card. It's 50 plus pages. And it talks about um, emergency savings accounts, retirement, um, 
see how to buy a home, um, auto loans, anything money related, it dives into. And it also ha we have modules, um, lessons, workshops, webinars um, on our platform. The healthcare professionals get access one-to-one uh, -one with the certified financial planner. So a financial coach that they can hop on a call with and ask questions about either their report card or some of their goals that they're working on with their finances. And then we also have a chat feature. So um, a lot of people are really hesitant tend to reach out to people about money because there's a lot of stigma around it. There's a lot of like shame and emotion, unfortunately. And although we do our best to help destigmatize that through our platform and just like the engagement, how we communicate with people about money, um, that it's still there. And so the chat feature allows people to get kind of those quick questions answered um, without having to get in front of someone. Yeah. yeah. So with this, with would this be like all like virtual, like online type stuff, or will there actually be like an invest health employee, like a counselor or something like that on site? Yeah. Well, not on, like not on site physically anywhere. All of this stuff is virtual through like Zooms okay. and chats, but we have someone available 24 seven. But um, oh, yeah, no, cool. nothing really physical. We have done like onboarding uh, for certain facilities to come in place just to promote engagement and um, user use. Um, and that's that's most of the in person. Cool. Yeah. You mentioned earlier how money is not really talked about. It's it's stigmatized and it's competitive. Like I feel like there's so much competition in who makes more money and all this stuff that it's just not talked about as much as it needs to be. Because as we said earlier, like doing a budget is step one that puts you ahead of a lot of people that are not doing any sort of a budget. Um, but I feel like we kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Invest Health, that's your newest endeavor. Um, but before you yeah. before you launched Invest, Invest Health, you started doing a little bit of re real estate education and um, so talk about your beginnings in, in real estate. Yeah. So um, early on into real estate, I mean, we didn't know anyone that was doing it. And so it was a lot of self-education, listening to um, podcasts. Uh, Bigger Pockets was huge. Um, looking, reading books, YouTube channels, um, learning the terms. Real estate is an entirely different language, but I always stress to healthcare professionals, you have learned medical terminology, so you can learn real estate investing too. Um, it just kind of takes some some time. And so podcasts, I feel like is the best way to do it because you hear people talk about the terms and they just kind of sink in through osmosis. Um, so I was doing a lot of self-educating and then um, kind of joining some different groups. I paid for a coaching program really early on. So um, we did a couple of long-term rentals across the country in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we took out, we didn't even have any money to start investing in real estate when we learned about it, but we were so motivated to do it that we just started asking around and looking for different options. And it was talking to a really good lender and learning that I had a hundred thousand dollars worth of equity in my primary residence. I was so new to real estate investing. I didn't even know what equity was or what you could do with it. Um, but I found out that I could take it out on a loan. It was my money that I could take it out at a, a four and a half percent interest rate and put it in a real estate investment that's earning me 20 percent. So not only am I able to pay off that loan every month, now it's putting money back into my pocket every month. So that was like an aha moment, the cash flow aspect of real estate investing. So um, did that on a couple of long term rentals across the country. And then again, didn't have any money to keep building real estate. And um, at that point, we had kind of started generating some interest from friends and family, like wanting to kind of partner with us or get involved. And we didn't even know this at the time, but that's what syndications are. So real estate syndications are people pooling together their resources, some people who want to take a more active approach, they want to find the deal, get the financing, do the asset management. That's what we love doing, right? And then we partner with people who want to take a passive approach to real estate investing. So people who really just want to hand over their money to operators who know what they're doing and are going to earn them some returns. And so um, real estate syndications is what we do now. So it's funny you say that about all these different medical terminologies. Like we're just, we've been exposed to it for so long as nurses that I guess we kind of take it for granted. But when me and, well, me, myself, but I assume Colin was in a similar situation. When you first start learning real estate, you're, you're talking about cap rates and ROI and PMI and all these other terms. And it took us um, way longer than it probably should have to learn what these actually meant. But there's kind of a running joke between me and Colin, like what cap rate actually is. It was something that, <laughs> it was something that we debated back and forth so many times. And um, I think we know what it is now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not sure if Josh knows that, to be I quite don't know. honest. I think you're uh, <laughs> up for debate still. We both we <laughs> yeah, agree we've agreed to disagree on that one. Um and it shouldn't be anything like that. It should be a, like 
this is what it is, but that's, that's how it goes. Um, but so you you kind of mentioned that you're, you're all in the, even when you were in the hospital, you were all about the operations and kind of making, I don't know, policies or whatever you, what were you doing in the hospital, I guess? <laughs> so, <laughs> Jeff, uh -huh. yeah. Corrections administration, solve oh, problems, all day. putting out fires, process improvement. Yeah. So how do you think that contributed to what you're doing now in real estate? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely transferred over. I think nurses in general, we learn so many skills of delegation and prioritization and organization. Like those are huge. I mean, you're, to, you're nursing day to day functions on how well you organize yourself, how well you can prioritize and how well you can delegate. Um, and so I, I'd always tell nurses, they really make the best investors. Um, but those skills have, have definitely transformed over into the real estate business and what, I mean, it's setting up systems and it was definitely new to me. I mean, I don't have a business degree or anything like that. Now I have, uh, I mean, I think we have six LLCs. Every apartment we have is its own LLC and managing all these different bank accounts. It's pretty crazy now what it's grown into, but it forces you um, to build systems uh, to operate a business. And so that that's been really fun and new uh, moving from a nurse into this space. So as, as, that's obviously your side of things, but you've built this business with your husband. Um, so how do you guys kind of complement each other? I'm, I'm working with my wife and Josh and I as business partners kind of realized, I think we realized early on, but then just kind of like ignored it. But uh, we don't complement each other well in business. Um, we, we have very much like very much have the same set of skills. And it wasn't until we got my wife involved that we realize like, oh, okay, yeah, she actually compliments like us in terms of her skills. But it's, it's, you know, that whole dynamic of like building a business with your husband it, or, or in my case, wife, but it can be a, it can be difficult, you know? So how, how has that been for you guys and how do you guys compliment each other? Yeah. It's so funny. I went to a real estate conference last month in Arizona and like everyone I talked to in the room was doing real estate with their spouse. And it was just so crazy to hear and see, because I mean, for me and my relationship and my marriage and my life, like it's a very integrated into my day to day. I mean, it's such a passion. I mean, it's something I share with all my family members and friends that I could not imagine my husband not doing it. Um, with me, it's it's very similar to parenting, right? I feel like if you can parent and like tag team that, you can build a business together. Like definitely there's points where you're stepping on each other's toes and you need to kind of learn the, the balance. But um, it's been really fun doing with him. Uh, I would say early on, we went through like that first syndication deal together side by side, wanting to learn every aspect of it. So both of us were doing the underwriting. We were having investor calls. We were on all the calls with the legal team together, with the property managers, with investors, um, and then after we did that first deal, that's when we kind of split up and identified what each other's strong set skill sets were. Like, to be honest, I thought I was going to do asset management just because of how I would operate different units in the hospital. Um, I, I thought I would love it. And it took a couple of calls with contractors to be like, mm, yeah, hell no, I am not going to be doing any asset management. <laughs> um, and so my husband really kind of took that over. I love talking to investors more. And so being able to chat this stuff with um, nurses. So my husband does all of the acquisitions and asset management. So he's out finding the deals. He has the relationships with the brokers. Um, he's getting the deal to the finish line, doing all the due diligence, all the underwriting, um, and then managing the asset throughout the lifetime of the investment. And then I do a lot more of the investor relations, the marketing, all of the communications, uh, the face of the business in a sense. Nice. So you guys, it, it's a lot. So when we started doing business, it's it takes a lot more time and a lot more uh, discipline, I guess, than than I realized. And I should have known this, but I, I don't know. We're, we're more along the lines of like, let's do it and we can figure it out later. Um, so like once we started doing it, we realized that it actually takes a lot more time and a lot more effort and a lot more work than I than I originally thought. And you mentioned you have a family, you have um, a kid. Do you have one or two kids? You have two, two daughters. Two daughters. Yeah, three and five. yeah so it's it's extremely difficult running a family and all this stuff that you're doing on top of it so how do you kind of find a balance and and what do you do that kind of helps you out with your time and with your uh with your the skills that you're trying to put everywhere yeah definitely a strong why and that was something another reason why i couldn't imagine doing it without my husband because really early on as we got into real estate investing we sat down and set three-year goals for ourselves like 
How much money did we want to be coming in every month from real estate investments in three years? What did our portfolio look like? Who are we doing business with? What was our day to day? Like, how are we living life? And we got super clear on those goals. And it's crazy because three years later, we surpassed them. Um, But it was just such a great exercise because in those hard moments, when you had a long day at work, you put the kids to bed and you just like are freaking exhausted, but you have investor emails to get back to. And I, when I launched my brand, I made it a goal to be on a hundred podcasts in a year. And so I was recording multiple podcasts. I'd be up at 5 a.m. If I could do an East Coast podcast session before I went into work on the West Coast, like I was doing it. Um, It was definitely a grind. But for me, I saw the numbers. I mean, real estate investing, there is so much risk you can mitigate by proper underwriting, by market research. Like I saw how lucrative real estate investing could be. And in comparison to the stock market, where you as an investor have zero control over those investments, real estate investing, you you can have some control. You can buy a building that's undervalued, negotiate a good deal, put all the work, time and energy into it and force value and appreciation and, and make huge returns. I mean, that's ownership and control you can have as a real estate investor. And I love that. So um, us seeing that was really motivating. Um, and honestly, I mean, less than three years, like what freedom it has provided to our lives. Like we joke, like during the week, we can go out to lunch and we joke that we're hanging out with the retired people here in Santa Rosa um, because we don't have the Monday through Friday grind anymore. And it's just, I mean, not a day goes by that we aren't making some sort of comment about how like blessed and thankful and grateful we are that we put in all that work because it's just completely transformed our life. I know that's that's one way that I've had to ch- kind of change my mindset is is there's there's going to be really busy seasons um, of your life. Like right now, it might be a busy season, but you're you're creating this busy season. So two years from now, it's really relaxed and enjoyable. Um, so you talked about your three year goals. Do you mind do you mind kind of giving us some specifics on what those might have been when you first started? Yeah. So um, when we first started, our goal was to earn to earn ten thousand dollars a month in real estate income, and um, that was in a way less than our net in or like it was equivalent to like our net income from our W2. But the way real estate ta- is taxed, you're not taxed on all of that. So 10000 a month from real estate investments is a lot different than $10,000 a month at your employer where they take, I'm in California, they take 30% of it, right? <laughs> so being able to look at those numbers and see really what it looks like in your life. So yeah, $10,000 um, a month, like I always had a goal to network and be involved with a lot of people, have relationships, be able to provide this opportunity to nurses. Like we've now raised four and a half million dollars primarily from healthcare professionals to get them in these deals. And we're coming up on exiting our, um, our, one of our first syndication deals. It was the second building we ever bought and we're um, selling it. We're under contract. We just completed due diligence. We're set to sell in January and we're going to be earning our investors 25% AAR on that building. So just be able to, just being able to deliver those type of returns to our investments who are our family members. You know, I have grandparents, my father-in-law and I deal, we have nurses that I work with. And so it's like more um, than just about ourselves. It's about the entire healthcare community. Um, and so that's that's super motivating. And one part of, the, part of the question I didn't answer before, like how did I keep sanity during the time? Because I think that's something important that I kind of glazed over. Um, definitely a meditation practice. Um, I have very strong yoga practice as well. Like I definitely make it a point. Like I quit drink, I quit drinking alcohol three years ago when I turned 30, like after having kids, like a lot of habits and I've made a lot of lifestyle changes to just be more incongruent with the life I want to be living. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, had a margarita at dinner last night and did not sleep well. So I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I had so many of those mornings, trust me. And I'm like, when I, I'm like, no, I'm leaving that in my 20s. I'm done. It was just one. And I was like, man, like, what is happening? I think it's time. <laughs> so now, now I'm old. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> that it. old. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely, you mentioned syndications. And that's definitely something we want to get into because um, I think it's, it's, it can be a very powerful tool. Um, we've talked to a couple people and even ourselves, like, n- are not necessarily opposed to syndications, but are just kind of using a different technique. Um, but before we get into that, earlier you mentioned using uh, essentially using debt to buy your first property. And I know that's a big uh, holdup for a lot of people as far as like, you know, good debt versus bad debt. So can you kind of talk about 
more more a little more about the actual strategy because I think it sounded like you used a HELOC. Yeah, well, um, just to even take things a step back, like really in America, we have such an amazing opportunity that we as investors and consumers can put 25,000 down and go out and buy an $100,000 asset, you know, and a $100,000 investment. Nowhere else, I mean, in crypto, are you putting a quarter percent down and earning income on something that's four times that, where in real estate, you can get down on a 25% down payment. Um, and, and buy an asset that's bringing in large cash flow, like a, a the large building would. And so just being able to think about money and that concept. Um, also, I mean, I, and it was something that when we went to take out a second mortgage on our primary residence, I mean, that wasn't something that I told my friends and family, like I didn't want their way in on it. I didn't think it was going to be positive. I thought it would be like, careful, watch what you're doing type thing. And it was for me talking to experienced real estate investors, experienced lenders who are out there doing this and watching people make extreme amounts of money by doing this and taking this risk of leveraging debt. I mean, when you change the uh, mindset that you're using money as a tool um, and, and you're not at its advantage, I mean, you can use it to buy you assets and invest and to grow money in your sleep. Um, and so I think really just the mindset shift was the biggest piece on that. But I mean, even since we've taken out um, loans on our retirement plans um, during COVID, you could take out some of your retirement um, penalty free under the CARES Act. Like we dipped into that. Like we've leveraged debt in so many aspects of our life. I mean, I'm building a startup. I have a good chunk of credit card debt on that right now, but you know, I know that it's going to be going towards a profitable business. So it's not, I'm not, yes, it makes me a little nervous to put 50K on a credit card to build a business. Right. Um, but that's the risk that I want to see out and take. And I, I know it'll be, um, it'll be beneficial. So I guess, I guess one thing on that piece, like why why the credit card versus like an SBA loan or, or small business loan? It's kind of on it, honestly, um, just being a new business owner and it's really just kind of accumulated over time. Um, we've been in different positions where we've wanted to raise for that venture or have. Yeah, I mean, we can do on the credit card, zero interest free. We've been able to transfer that to another zero interest. So we've been able to kind of maintain credit card balance with like zero interest for a couple of years. We're now kind of getting to the point where we're going to need to be making income from the business to pay that off or enough to pay it off. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm always learning about different ways to use money as a tool. And that was, I mean, even as a thing when I had all that credit card debt and it was coming up to a year, I didn't know what to do. And I was talking to a good friend, CPA, um, and just kind of running it by him. And he was like, oh, you can transfer that to a new credit card and have zero interest. And I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Like you can take all this $30,000 and just transfer it over to Discover and maintain it with zero interest. Like you can do that. And he's like, yeah. And I did it with a click of a button. Yeah. Like that's just the thing of like, having those relationships and being able and willing to openly talk. You know, if I was embarrassed to admit that I had $30,000 of credit on a, or, you know, on a credit card, yeah. I would have never gotten that solution, but because I'm very open about talking about it and trying to find out solutions, like it creates so much more opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. This is good that it's coming up now because I've always been the type of person like, oh, credit cards is evil. Like that's going to take you to your grave. <laughs> but we're actually having somebody come on in a couple of weeks that's going to talk about how to use credit cards specifically to your own advantage. And um, this is like you say this right now, you can just transfer a balance from one credit card to another. And this is... I'm gonna have to look into that is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> that, and that's, and that's the thing. It's like, even like simple things like that, that like people don't know. And it, the guy that we're talking, we're talking about bringing on, I actually just like shared a cab with him after WealthCon or uh, an Uber. I guess people don't use cabs anymore, but he was just like telling me all this, Oh, you just transfer it from here to here. And then you book this flight for this. And then you get this upgrade at the hotel. And I was like, wait, what? And then we get to the airport. And he takes me into the American Express lounge and like I get like so <laughs> like dinner and like dessert and all this stuff. And I was like, wait, what? Like, and he's just like, yeah, it's all points. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, you're yeah, coming yes, off. I'm learning lots of points on mine yeah. too. I'm, yeah. So so credit cards, not all only bad. They can, they can be used to your advantage. When, when yes, used to your absolutely. advantage, they're not bad. <laughs> wait, yes. Yeah. You got to be smart about it. There's a difference between good debt and bad debt for sure. Yeah. yeah. So kind of going back into the syndications, do you mind kind of walking us through, um, you said that you used a syndication on your second deal. Um, do you mind kind of going through your first deal like really briefly and then kind of diving into the second deal as a syndication? 
Yeah. Um, so our first couple of deals were long-term rentals across the country. So they were new built townhomes. So we had taken out, we had that hundred thousand dollars with the equity in our primary residence. We were able to take out 80,000 of it and we used it to those $40,000 each on two as down payments on two new build townhomes. Um, they were built to rent projects. So the builders put in after they build it their own property management and it's pretty turnkey and easy. And so they were across the country in Atlanta, Georgia. We were in Los Angeles at the time and it was difficult to find property local. And then also we heard, you know, buying across the country, it forces you as an investor to create systems in place. Whereas you buy in the same court that you live in, you're going to be over there all the time, spending all this time and energy on it. When you buy a house across the country, it forces you to put the systems in place. You're not spending all your time on it. And so we weren't necessarily opposed to investing out of the country. I think that was another like mindset shift that we had to get into. But uh, yeah, those were really easy. Um, they were only cash flowing like a couple hundred bucks a month. Um, but, and then it took like a tenant moving out at six months and they, they, I don't know, they dirtied up the walls and we had to spend like 3K to paint, repaint it. And then it completely depleted our cash flow. And then it was at that point that we moved into multifamily because multifamily units, you really de mitigate a lot of that risk because of the multiples. So now you have so many units under one roof sharing some of the expenses. So the overhead isn't as high and the profits are a lot larger. So that's how we got to. Um, syndications, which our first deal on that was like a 12 unit multifamily building. We look for strong value add buildings. So um, we're looking for maybe owners who've uh, owned it in the family for generations. They're not taking care of it. Um, some of the repairs and maintenance items are going way out of whack. Um, and we see the opportunity there. They maybe don't want to replace the roof. They don't want to replace the windows or turn the units. They'd rather sell the building. And so that's where the opportunity is. We're willing to do that. So we come in um, and really, in a sense, flip these apartment buildings over like a five-year period. Um, and we raise capital from our investors for, and we also heavily invest in all of our deals, but we raise capital for the down payment and then any repairs and renovations. Um, and then we get our investors in the deal close on it. And then every three months we get all cash flowing. So they're cash flowing day one. Um, so any of the extra cash flow after we pay our expenses. So income comes in from the building, meaning all the tenants are paying their rent. We also get income from laundry, parking, pet fees, all this other stuff. There's a lot of ways to generate income from multifamily. After all the income, we pay the expenses, uh, which could be like property management, utilities, landscaping, that type of stuff. All the leftover money is the cash flow. And we distribute that to um, our investors based on how much they've invested in the deal. The first time we ever looked at doing a syndication, or we didn't really actually look at it like for a deal that we were looking at, but when we were just learning about it originally, um, we saw the lawyer fees and we're like, oh, yep, can't do that. <laughs> so, so, okay. so it's, it's, <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's, there's, there's a team that's involved when doing a syndication. It's not just, it's not just getting a bunch of people's money to buy an asset. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, and that's why early on, as we decided we were going to do this, we spent $30,000 at a coaching program. I mean, that was more than my master's degree in nursing. Um, and that was we when we decided that we were going to be handling, I mean, millions of dollars of other people's money and that we needed to be doing everything we could to make sure we were doing it the right way. And so we invested in the coaching program so that we could have people with decades of years of experience looking over our shoulder, both at the deals we were doing and also the legalities of it. But um, yeah, I mean, our our lawyer to us is a very similar relationship as our accountant. Like if you're investing in real estate, you, you've got to have a great relationship with your accountant. There is, there is really not a money move that we that my husband and I do in our lives that we don't throw first consult with our accountant um, just to see the best way to do that. They just know how to make money work to your advantage. And similar to a, a lawyer, I mean, they're they're going to be structuring these deals um, so that they're fair and equal to everyone. And it's a very big aspect of the deal and something that could be a little bit of a deterrent to, to people coming into it. But I mean, I just share with healthcare professionals. I mean, when you sign up for your IRA account or your 401k, I mean, there's hundreds of legal pages of legal terms that you're clicking through with a sign off of a button, you know, you're not reading it. Um, so with ours, uh, it's, it just basically, it's a close 100 pages, uh, but we give our investors plenty of time to look through it. Um, and then that's 
really the the signing on with the deal. So as for the lawyer, um, when you're doing these syndications, because you're still doing them out of state, uh, do you have somebody that can work nationally or how do you how do you do that? Do you have one lawyer you're working with or are you doing one in each state where you're buying properties? Yeah. Um, so we do have a lawyer in Oregon who's like of our point of contact there in the state. And then our lawyer is based in Texas and he can do business across the country. And then we have investors that um, invest across the country as well. We just do blue sky filings. Um, and then there's different parameters with our investors. Um, some have to be, uh, there's a 506C where you have to have accredited investors. You have to be accredited to invest in syndication deals. We do 506B offerings. So our investors do not have to be accredited. And that's specifically because most nurses aren't accredited. And I love giving nurses the opportunities to jump in these deals. So that's why we continue to do the 506B filings. And Really quickly, the difference between an unaccredited investor and an accredited investor. So an accredited investor just means that you solely have to be making over a um, hundred thousand, uh, um, a hundred thousand a year with, and then combined with your spouse, two hundred, or you have to have a million dollars in net worth or liquidity. So there's there's a lot of a lot of moving parts to this. So like um, I, I, me and Colin both, we joined a mentorship program and it's high ticket. They're very expensive, but they kind of get you the, the base knowledge that you need to start doing stuff like this. Um, so you kind of mentioned a little bit about your mentorship program, but what kind of, what led you into doing that as opposed to just trying to figure it out slowly one, one step at a time on your own? Yeah. I mean, we, when we learned about real estate syndications and, and how you could scale it into a business, I mean, we were all in, like we knew that that would be the way, I mean, just how some people build a portfolio of short-term rentals. Um, some people build a portfolio of long-term rentals. I mean, we just, when we learned about multifamily and syndications, like we were all in, like we knew that this was the real estate investment strategy that we were all in on. Um, and it's performed very well throughout the COVID pandemic. Multifamily was the first asset class to bounce back after the 2008 housing crisis. It did very, very well throughout the COVID pandemic as well. Um, so it's been a, it's been a fun ride. So it's in terms, I, in, in terms of like you and your husband, um, are you guys getting your money from these syndications from the cash flow, from the acquisition fee, the management fee? Like where are you guys getting the bulk of that income? Yeah. So in the syndications deals, there are acquisition fees. Um, and then also there's a split for our investors. So we earn a percentage of the deal just for being the general partners. So the general partners, the responsibility, finding the deal, due diligence, underwriting, getting the financing for it, doing all the legalities, raising all the capital, managing the deal throughout the lifetime and the investment. It's a, it's a big responsibility. And so there's a portion of the um, property that goes towards the general partnership team for that. And then there's a small asset management fee that is uh, minimal compared to what they take in the stock market as well. What does your day look like right now? You said you're a little bit in the hospital still. Sounds like you're putting a lot of time into your syndications and your new startup. Kind of walk us through a, a day in the life. <laughs> yeah. So I work two days a week in the hospital. I actually just switched to night shift. It's 25% paid. Oh, to, uh, why would you do here. that? No, just kidding. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. So I'm going to work every Saturday, Sunday night and then get off Monday morning and then just have like my whole week with my family and my girls and my business and that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, like a typical day. I mean, when I go to the hospital, it's a hospital. I'm a med surge ortho floor. So I'm dishing out pain meds and doing dressing changes all day. Um, but when I'm building like real estate stuff, I have a lot of calls. I still do a lot of podcasts. I usually do like two or three podcasts a week still, um, or different webinars or just chatting with different people in the nursing community, just trying to share this information with as many healthcare professionals as possible. I'm super active on social media. Um, so I spend a lot of time there as well. I have a Facebook group that I do monthly meetups on, um, that, catered mostly to healthcare professionals. Um, I still look at real estate deals. We're looking at real estate in Belize right now. So it's always fun to um, see those come through some islands and stuff. Um, so yeah, always looking at real estate deals. I mean, coaching, I do a lot of coaching, helping a lot of people get into real estate investing um, and then spend a lot of time on the startup. So I have a nurse co-founder that I'm building that with and just onboarding new clients and doing a lot of marketing with that too. We just partnered with a a California last month to do a financial wellness campaign. Um, and then January is financial wellness month. So we're going to be partnering with a lot of different staffing agencies and healthcare organizations to do different webinars and workshops. 
Wow. That's uh, you make me feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm like uh, not doing I'm, enough. I'm calling. like I'm like get oh, back I'm, to work. <laughs> I'm so busy, and then it's just like oh yeah, I guess not. All right. I'm going to step in. I'm going to quit drinking. And, uh. I got a full-time VA about a year ago, and she is a game changer. She has helped so, so, so much. So slowly but surely, I've been scaling and building up. So I'm not doing 100% on my own anymore. But um, yeah, I got help. Yeah. So for the, um, you know, you being in nursing still, is that more to do with the the startup you're doing right now and kind of needing some funding for that? Like if you weren't doing that and you were just doing the real estate, would you have already replaced your RN income? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yes. Um, real estate has definitely um, given us so much more freedom that it's allowed me to sink a good amount of money into the startup to get that going. Um, so yeah, that the real estate is very, um, that's the income that we're generating and continuing to grow. That's our main form of investment now. Uh, just working at the hospital right now is really just to maintain the benefits. Um, moving my husband out of his full-time job six months ago, we're just kind of leaning on that probably for the next year. In May, it'll be 10 years as a nurse for me. So I'm hoping that'll be kind of where I cut it off. But I think um, especially being a startup founder, nurse-founded company, like I, it's very helpful to still be in the healthcare system. Like I can't tell you every Every day I go to the hospital, I hear nurses and doctors complaining about finances in some way. And I jump into those conversations with real estate and investing and all that stuff. And so for me, especially as I'm building out that product and then I'm continuing to do the real estate deals, it's awesome to just be in the healthcare community and hear what a struggle financial wellness is and financial health. Um, so that part is, is really helpful. But I think at 10 years, I'll be ready to give up bedside. Yeah. What, what I mean, I guess the next three years or so, you kind of talked about that, but just like overall your plans for all your different businesses going forward, or what, what's, that, what's that going to look like? Yeah, I mean, definitely just to share more financial health with healthcare professionals. I mean, that's kind of like the basis of everything I've done with Net Worth Nurse. And every, I mean, that's really my personal brand now and just sharing information. I have tons of free downloads and resources and courses and stuff available on my net worth nurse website um, that people are tapping into. But um, even with my real estate investing, it's giving healthcare professionals the opportunity to grow wealth differently, to diversify their um, investments. And so really like my overarching goal for like everything I'm doing is just to promote more financial wellness for healthcare professionals. Like I just, it was so heartbreaking to see throughout the pandemic, like nurses and doctors that could save lives, but were living paycheck to paycheck, dealing with hundreds of thousands worth of student loan debt, like getting crushed, like sacrificing their physical and mental health to pick up overtime and double time. Like I was working double time to build, save up to buy my first investment property. Like healthcare professionals think that the only way they can grow wealth is by sacrificing that to work the double time and the overtime. And so I just want to share with the healthcare community that there are other ways to grow wealth. And the more that insight that you have into your finances, uh, the more you control and ownership you can take over your financial future. So you sound you sound very passionate about this, and it's it's really refreshing to hear. Um, but say say I'm a nurse and I work with you, and I I don't know what to do, and I have a little bit of extra money. Like, can you give me like a little elevator pitch or something? Like, how how can oh, I yeah. <laughs> how can I invest my money with you? I get ten of these calls a week. Uh, <laughs> So uh, really when I get nurse healthcare professionals on the phone and they want to get into real estate investing, they got money. I mean, I always say first, identify if you want to be active or passive. Like that is number one. Do you want to take an active role in real estate investing where you want to go out and find the property and get the financing and turn it into a short-term rental and have a vacation property that you can go and do? And I have seen hundreds of healthcare professionals do this. You can do it um, for sure if you want to. Some people don't want to. They don't want to deal with the tenants, toilets, and trash. They don't want to have to do the work to do it. So if that's the route, then hey, maybe check out real estate syndication. See that there's still these passive investment opportunities where you can jump into real estate investing and still achieve some of those returns that you're wanting from real estate. So that's always um, first question. And then if they're wanting to do it on their own, I have tons of resources for like coaching or I just get them plugged into kind of what strategy that would be next step, um, identifying what strategy you want to do because there's so many in real estate investing. Um, but then if it's more the passive route, then I have investors. They can hop onto my investor portal and check out some of my past deals, what I've done. I offer up 
chatting with any of my current investors. I have tons of, I have pharmacists, doctors, physical therapists, nurses. I mean, I can connect any of them with that to get kind of a referral and hear how the investments work. So those are kind of my two routes when I hop on calls with people. What what would you tell a nurse in April of 2022 that was thinking about cashing out their 401k to buy a fourplex? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little personal. Still oh, just, just, just random, <laughs> just random, random thought. <laughs> Would you advise yes or no? <laughs> oh man, with two years up as an FHA loan? No, it's uh, it was just no, it's regular. Yeah, we just bought a, an investment oh, property, so yeah. But I was I was kind of looking at that, you know, like like you mentioned with the stock market, you know, and the returns. Like I was looking at what the stock market was doing, and it, it had climbed really high, but then all of a sudden I just started saw it start going down, and it was like I think in like a week I lost like ten thousand or something, something like. Wow. It was, it was, and I just seeing that just like it hurt. And so I just pulled the trigger and, and our, our accountant at the <laughs> time, I was like, I was like, Hey, you're not going to like this, but I'm planning on cashing out my 401k to buy this fourplex. She's like, you're right. I don't like it, but I guess do it. <laughs> and, and it goes back to the whole control thing. Like we, we have no idea what's going to happen in the stock market. I mean, there's yeah. a, re- there's really smart people that kind of maybe do, but us as like novice stock market investors have no idea what's going on over there. Right. Um, but in real estate, we've kind of figured out some things and and kind of know how to mani- not manipulate, but know how to grow our wealth a little bit yeah. more strategically. Oh. Yeah. Real estate investing, you can do market analysis. You can look at population trends. You can look at job growth, opportunities like that. I mean, when we look at an apartment building, we get a full T12. So the t- trailing 12 months, we get access to the full p l profit and loss statement. So we're seeing how this building has been generating income for the last one year, two years, however long. And so we get a really good insight into how much potential we can make in this building. If we see opportunities where we can decrease some of those expenses, we had a building that had huge water expenses. We went and did a inspection on the property. I mean, every shower head was leaking, every faucet. We go in there with the state of Oregon who pays to have um, waterproof um the aerators for water conservation for shower heads and aerators. I mean, we implement those for free into all our buildings, drastically drop the water bill. When you can do that on a large apartment complex, I mean, the economy is a scale. There's just so much risk that you can mitigate in real estate investing as opposed to the stock market. I mean, even the comment you just said, it's so funny. Like my grandma, when I first started doing these investments like three years ago, she was like, I remember thinking there was no way I was ever going to jump into one of your investments. Like there was just absolutely, I would, I could never do it. And she's like, but now I'm watching my money just dwindle away in the stock. Like all my retirement just like, disappear in the stock market. She's like, I'd rather hand this money to you. Like, let me know when you have your next deal type thing. And it's like, people think real estate's so risky and emotional. And I tell the people that are on their phones every day looking at the stock market, I mean, that's risky and emotional. So yeah, well, and and for somebody like your grandma, who's like, not probably retired, I would imagine, like, she has so so no penalty. Right. Well, no, but there's th- not, not just that, but it's like, there's no active income coming in. It's like, for me, it was like, right. you know, like, Hey, like this is going down. I can keep working. I can kind of like, you know, balance this out. But yeah, like if you're retired and you're just watching your, your, yeah. your, your 401k, that's all the money down, you have, it's just like, and it's going down, right. man. Yeah. So, um, I guess another question we have here is, are you doing any other kind of investing or are you doing real estate and that's that's the end all be all or you do you are you diversified in any other areas um, i mean i love learning about investing so I, ha- I have an nft um that i'm just kind of sitting on watching that i i threw some money in the crypto and uh yeah didn't didn't fare so well there um yeah. but i mean that just kind of was more reassurance for me that like how much i love real estate investing but honestly like my full focus is is real estate. I mean, we're all in on it. Um, I contribute through my employer just to meet employer match. So right now I'm doing 5%. Um, when I was a new grad nurse, I was doing 20%. Like that's how motivated I was to hit wow. like financial freedom and to be smart with my money. And everyone was like, oh, great, 15 to 20% of your paycheck, you're going to be set. And to me, it was like, when I'm 59 and a half, like that's not soon enough. Like, and now since I've like taken more ownership of that money, like the freedom I've been able to create in my life has just outperformed what I ever would have done if I left that 15 to 20% in the stock market doing that. Although for some people that is the right choice. So not, not for everyone to pull it all out, but um, yeah, it's, it's something that I, I still do, but uh, it's, 
pretty much all real estate now. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, gambling and uh, things that ter- <laughs> just, ter- terms we don't understand, what is an NFT? <laughs> is this like oh, great? It sounds something it, like that. No, because you don't. Art. You don't even know what it is it's either. Digital. Okay. No, not it's you, digital Josh. Digital art. Oh, okay. Like, I don't even know what it stands for, but it's digital art, and um, I'm a huge Ryan Pineda fan, and he was um, pushing out some of those a year or so ago, and so I got one of his. Okay, but it's just okay. It's just art. Like, what do you like? So, is it just like a piece, like in a museum? There's, that- I mean, there's there's a uh, currency to it. There's uh, properties. I'm really not into it as much as uh, a lot of other people, <laughs> so I'm probably slaughtering all these terms. But there's utilities to it. I believe is what it's called, okay. and there's ways that you can. Um, stake them and earn income on them. In his community, he does a lot of conferences and real estate and that type of stuff. And so there's ways that you can kind of work in his community with the Thai coin, which is what it is. It's Tykes as an NFT. Um, so yeah. So you so speaking of Ryan Pineda, that that's one of the high ticket uh, mentorships that we joined uh, a few months ago. Yeah. And I and, and I you dr- haven't heard of NFTs. No, so. well, so I'm just focusing on the real estate stuff. He's focusing on the yeah. creator. Heard of it? We've heard I've of heard it. Heard of it? But like, what is what is it? Like, I don't know. I'll be honest. Yeah. Even after you just said that, I still don't know what an NFT. Is. <laughs> <laughs> it's neither. You're sad. This is like my husband. He's like, what did you buy? Yeah. What do we have? <laughs> what is that? Your husband. And how can and how is that useful to me? He's thinking exactly. Sure. <laughs> your your husband sounds like like a, my kind of guy. He's probably like, can you trade this for food if something like bad happens? <laughs> and the answer is no. This is why he he does all the numbers <laughs> on our deals, and I'm more like, yeah, the vision type thing. Yeah. Well, that's uh, so. So we're gonna we're gonna step into our final segment that we call the final four. And then we realized yesterday that there's five questions in this final four, but we're gonna go with it. So yeah. let's um, do it. What is a top financial resource that you have found for nurses? Ooh, for nurses, I would just say social media. Um, there's a lot of cool nurses doing great things. I mean, you got yourselves included with the podcast and that type of stuff. I mean, um, I think it can be intimidating coming into space. There's different personalities for different people, not knowing who you want to connect with. If you hop on per- on social media, you'll find someone that's kind of your your rhythm. Yeah. Thank you. That's the goal is for us to be included in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there slowly. That's kind of my answer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> what, uh, so number two is what would you tell yourself as a new grad? Ooh, don't be afraid to switch specialties. I remember, I mean, I've switched specialties like within, I've been with Providence, this healthcare system last seven years, and I've switched roles five times in the system. Um, And I remember as a new grad being hesitant to do that, wanting to gain more experience in one specific unit, feeling like that meant more to other people. But now I've been able to work in so many different departments in the hospital that I feel like it kind of gives me a high level of view and I don't, I don't regret it. So, um, but that's what I would say to a new grad. One more question on, on that. So I always tell everybody like, don't be like, don't be tied to one hospital either um, because loyalty doesn't pay anymore. So you gotta, nope. you gotta move around. Now, when you're switching positions inside the same facility, do you see that as well? Like, do you see there being advantages to that or is it? Definitely, yeah, okay. especially for leadership, for sure. Um, I've worked with Sutter Healthcare. I've worked with surgery. I mean, I've worked with different healthcare organizations, um, but within Providence, the amount of, um, I guess, opportunities that they give to leaders within the system is is great. And so once I got my master's and showed an initiation and interest in leadership, um, they did a really good job of making sure that was like catered to and that I could I could move into positions that I liked. All right. So question three is, what is your big goal for the next 12 months? Ooh, big goal in the next 12 months. Um, to do uh, a property out of country. Um, that's just like a big life goal uh, to have something kind of out of country to go to and visit. And so um, we did kind of the more safe thing of doing the apartments that we've got four, five of those now. And so I think an international deal is coming up next this year. Sounds kind of cool. I think that's, uh, that's, that's my goal as well at some point, just because of my wife. That's like, she's like all about Italy and, or like somewhere in Europe. Oh, so <laughs> speaking my language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the fourth and final question before the bonus question is uh, if you were to tell people to do one thing right now, so our emphasis is kind of just like on right now, that's the other play on the RN. 
Um, what would that one thing that they can do right now be? Um, figure out, um, I would say set goals. Um, cause even if you set a one year goal and then set out all the action steps that it's going to take there. I mean, if you want to be earning $10,000 uh, a month in real estate investing in three years, like what do you need to be doing on a yearly basis, monthly basis, weekly basis to get to that goal? Um, and I think when you can kind of chuck things down like that, it makes it feel a little less scary. All right. Bonus question number five is what is the biggest financial mistake that you've made and how can other people avoid it? Oh, man, I'm, I'm always learning things. Um, financial mistake. I mean, one of our our first investment property, I mean, the cash flowing a couple hundred bucks a month and that large turnover happening early on. Uh, one of our first apartment complexes that we were going to buy, we were told by a broker that we could turn um, one of the storage facilities into an extra unit and vetted with some engineers and all that to get there. And they went to pull, pull permits and realized we couldn't do it. And so um, now we go to the the city um, on anything that we we see it ourselves. We don't trust the opinions of others, even if it's people we've worked with. I'm um, just seeing um, what's written, especially with real estate and laws and that type of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this has been awesome. I think uh, one of the great things about doing this podcast is selfishly is we get to learn a lot. So <laughs> I feel like we got a lot today. So thank you for coming on and talking to us. And uh, and everyone, and I guess January, I, I was like thinking as you were mentioning January uh, being Financial Awareness Month, we uh, this, would be, this would be a good one. So, yeah, yeah, awesome. be, but uh, but yeah, where, where can people find you and reach out? Yeah, um, so like I mentioned, social media, I'm super active there. I just give people an inside look at my life as a nurse, as a mom, as a real estate investor. So um, that's my favorite way to connect with people. I have websites, so networthnurse.co, um, and then I have investhealth.com. So those are the, the companies that I mentioned here. And anything about my real estate company can be found on Networth Nurse uh, website. And I love connecting with people, healthcare professionals, nurses about real estate investing. So if anything I've said has been remotely interesting, please reach out. I'd love to chat. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks.